Let's take another look at this big fella. Hey folks, my name's Steve and welcome to Scotia Astro. A couple of years ago I shared a first look video on this Bresser AR127L and I promised I would do a more in-depth review once I had a chance to play with it for a while. That time's long overdue and in this video I'll share my experiences with this scope, explain how I use it and along the way I'll detail some of the upgrades I've added to make it work for my specific use case. There's a lot to cover so let's get straight into it. I covered the main specs of this scope in my initial unboxing and first look so I won't go too in depth on that in this video. I'll link to my previous video up here and in the description below though so you can go check that out after this one. The Bresser AR127L is a 127mm achromatic refractor with a focal length of 1200mm and a focal ratio of f9.4. It weighs in at just under 8kg and it's around 120mm long so it's a big beast. Despite its length the OTA is lightweight enough to move around fairly easily, especially before any other gear is added. Bresser do a range of these quality acromats covering different apertures from 90mm right up to 152mm, so there's a good choice here depending on how you want to use your scope. Many of the larger scopes have long and short versions too. My 127 here is the long or the L version, but you can also get a shorter focal length one but with a faster focal ratio. The scope comes equipped with a solid 2.5 inch rack and pinion focuser and you get a whole host of additional accessories which you can check out in my previous video. As I was planning to use this scope for solar imaging, I replaced some of the included components right off the bat to increase stability. I swapped out the included Vixen style rail with a much beefier Lozmandi one, and I also replaced the handy top rail with a longer Vixen style rail from ADM. I kept the stock tube rings on the scope as they're pretty solid and they fit nicely with the replaced Vixen and Lozmandi rails, but it might be something I'll look to upgrade in the future. My plan was to use this scope as a long focal length solar imaging rig, so to avoid any stress about my heavy imaging train potentially slipping and crashing to the ground, I fitted this batter click lock adapter to the end of my focuser tube. This replaced the standard 2 inch to 1 and a quarter inch adapter that came with the scope. I use click locks on some of my other rigs and I've had zero issues with them, so I was confident that this solution would work well on this scope and I'm pleased to say that it has. For more precise focusing, especially when imaging, I added the excellent ZWO EAF which I use in some of my other Astro setups. For my solar imaging sessions I really prefer to stay out of the sun directly, so I usually attach a mini PC to my rig, like this one from Melee, and then I remote into one of my computers indoors. This is why an electronic autofocuser is vital for me. I really don't enjoy squinting at a laptop screen outdoors while trying to focus my scope manually. It's a first world problem to be sure, but guilty as charged. As an acromat, this big refractor might not really be first in line on your list of imaging scopes, as many of the issues inherent to the scope's design can be problematic, depending on how you want to use it. Unlike higher spec apochromatic refractors, when we're talking about imaging at least, the acromat design struggles to focus different wavelengths of light at the same point of your camera sensor or eyepiece. This can cause colour aberrations in your images, especially around brighter objects like the moon. This is a huge topic all on its own though, and there's so many nuances and different designs these days, I'm not going to delve any deeper into it in this video. It's a real minefield. In regards to my specific use case scenario though, the issues around wavelengths not focusing at the same point can be avoided, as solar imaging is best done with a monochrome camera, so colour fringing isn't really a consideration for me. Many of the popular achromatic refractors out there are made up of a simple doublet design, which doesn't include any of the more exotic glass that you'll find in higher priced apos. This means that a nice big achromat like my Bresser here is way cheaper than an apo at an equivalent aperture. When I bought the scope a couple of years back it was just under £300 on Amazon, but it's currently increased to just over £400, at the recording of this video at least. Although it costs more, I still think it's a great price for a nice quality 5 inch refractor. Let's turn now to solar imaging with this scope, which is its primary function for me, and I'll give you a rundown of the gear I use to get some close in shots of our home star. By using this scope along with some specialised solar imaging gear, its long focal length means I can get close in, high resolution images of the sun. That's all well and good, and it's certainly a benefit, but there's also some drawbacks. A long focal length refractor is generally physically long too, so you really need to think about which mount you're going to pair it with. This isn't such a huge deal for visual work, but imaging this close in in the sun means you need a strong and stable platform. Bigger mounts generally mean more cash outlay, so it's something you need to consider if you want to use this refractor as an imaging scope. With that in mind, let's start my gear breakdown from the bottom up. When I started with this scope I had it sitting on a Skywatcher NEQ6 Pro mount 
which was attached to a solid pillar mount and extension, also from Skywatcher. This worked well, but I did find at times that the tracking in the NEQ6 struggled a wee bit, and this led to some ruined images. I've now swapped this up to my current configuration, which is based around a Skywatcher AZ EQ6 GT Pro mount, and an Ioptron Tri-Peer. This pairing's been exceptional, and my scope now tracks the sun smoothly and accurately, which keeps my images clear and consistent. All of the imaging gear that sits at the focuser end of the scope is quite hefty, so the batter click lock adapter makes sure that it stays safe and secure. I'm using a Skywatcher 2 inch diagonal which holds my Daystar Quark and an imaging camera, which is either a Player 1 Apollo M Max or a ZW 174mm. The Quark is a great wee device that's basically a telecentric Barlow lens with a 4.2 times magnification and some special coatings to specifically target hydrogen alpha wavelengths. The Barlow element of this unit increases my effective focal length from 1200mm right up to a whopping 5040mm, so I can really highlight some of the fine details when the scene conditions allow. At this big aperture, it's really vital to use some sort of energy rejection filter when imaging the sun, and this helps prevent overheating and damage to your equipment. I use this 2 inch UV IR cut filter from Astronomic, and has worked brilliantly for me over the past few years. It's really important that the filter is right in front of your imaging train, so I screw it straight into the scope end of my diagonal. Two very popular cameras in the solar imaging scene are the ZWO 174mm and the Player One Apollo M Max. I've used both of them extensively, but I pretty much use the Apollo full time now in my Bressa rig, and the 174 usually sits in my smaller solar setup, built around my Skywatcher EvoStar 72 ED. I've also fitted an external fan to my Apollo, which is custom built by Player One for their cameras, and it also helps keep it cool over long sessions. I did a video a while back on how to fit it, so I'll link up here and in the description below if you want to learn more about it. I control all of my imaging sessions through a mini PC, and I remote into my outdoor office for comfortable imaging sessions out of the glare of the sun. I'm using a Miele PCG-02 Pro in this rig, and it's really lightweight and reliable. As it's so small, I can mount it under my Lozmandi plate or directly onto my tripeer with some great adapters from Buckeye Stargazer. To store my images and make sure I can get fast transfer speeds, I use my trusty Samsung external SSDs and I usually Velcro these to my top rail. This then gets plugged straight into my mini PC. At the start of my sessions, I usually align my scope to the sun using the reliable Skywatcher SynScan app on my iPhone. To make sure that the mount and app are talking to one another, I plug in this Wii Wi-Fi dongle to my AZEQ6, and I can control everything from the phone. It can be surprisingly difficult to get a lock in the sun right away, and the zoomed in focal length of this big scope makes that even harder. To help along the way, I've fitted this little solar finder from First Light Optics here in the UK. Once you're close to the sun, it forms a small ball of light in the back of the finder, and once you get it in the centre, you should see the sun in your camera sensor. It's a cheap and simple device, but it works really well. On the software side of things, I use a mix of programs for image capture and processing. SharpCap and its awesome features make my sessions pretty pain-free, and it plays very nice with both my cameras. Within SharpCap, I can control my mount and camera and also control focus, so it's really nice to have everything on one screen. When it comes to stacking and processing my images, I use a mixture of AutoStackert, IMPPG, PixInsight, and Photoshop. This covers me for still images, but also time lapses, which are really fun to try out. I'm not going to cover image capture and processing here, as there's already loads of excellent videos out there, but I'd really recommend you go and check out Simon Tang's videos on YouTube, and also look up his Instagram profile to see a true solar master at work. For simple time lapse capture and processing, Chuck's Astrophotography did an easy to follow video a few years back. I'll post links to both these talented fellas in the description below the video. With this much focal length at my disposal, I've been able to capture some epic views of the sun, taking in solar prominences, flares, filaments, and massive sunspots. I'm really a big fan of imaging the sun because its surface changes every day, so you can go back to it again and again and you'll never get the same picture twice. Taking dynamic time lapses are also great for capturing explosive events off the sun's surface, and as we're in the midst of a very active solar cycle, there's loads to capture. I've been really, really pleased with this scope, and when seeing conditions allow, this rig can capture some stunning high-resolution images, and I've captured some of my favourite pictures and video with it. The optics on this Bresser produce clear, well-defined solar images, and I'd highly recommend it if you're looking for an affordable upgrade, or you want to start out with a long focal-length scope. I haven't tried this scope for any deep-sky astrophotography, 
but if you were someone with a mono camera and a set of imaging filters already, I think this would be a great budget scope if you wanted to get a rig with more reach. I've seen some nice examples from other talented astrophotographers in Astrobin who are using this scope and its larger brother, the AR152. They cover deep sky astroimaging, but also some lunar and planetary work, so it can be done. There's nothing stopping you using a colour camera as well, but you'll have to contend with the aberrations that come part and parcel with an Acromat. In terms of image quality itself though, the optics on this scope are excellent, especially given its price point. Before I leave you, I'll share some of my visual experiences with the AR127, and I'll show you what I use to get some stunning views of our night sky up here in the Northern Hemisphere. My main visual scope is my excellent EVOSTAR 100ED, but when I want a bit more reach, I'll grab for my Bresher from time to time for a wee look up. It's really nice having a 5 inch refractor in my gear arsenal, and with 1200mm you can get some really nice views of many of the bright showpiece objects of the night sky. Star clusters like M13 and the double cluster in Perseus show bright and well defined stars against an inky black background. I've had some great sessions on the moon at different magnifications, and again the well figured optics of this scope make for some truly memorable views. There's only a small hint of fringing in the moon with this scope, but it doesn't really bother me or distract from the view. If you're someone who is bothered by it, then there's some filters you can get to lessen the effects, but I haven't used any, so I can't vouch for a particular brand or option here. As I already have a 2 inch diagonal in the scope for solar work, I tend to just leave it in there and just pop some eyepieces in for observing. I've recently picked up some bad Morpheus eyepieces, and I use them in a range of scopes for my visual sessions. I tend to use the 17.5mm most in the Bresser, but for some really wide views I occasionally pop in this 31mm spheric eyepiece from Bader's Hyperion range. For focus I use the ZWO EAF as it's already fitted to the scope, and I just attach this handy remote control unit. This is great for precise focusing, and it means I don't have to touch the scope or cause any wobbling in my eyepiece. I tend to leave my AZ EQ6 on permanent imaging duties, so for visual work I'll also use my NEQ6 as it's on the solid pillar mount and I get some extra height with the extension pier. This makes my observing sessions a bit more comfortable, and the scope has plenty of height and clearance around the mount. The story is really the same with this scope visually as it is for imaging. The optics are great, and again for the price you can have a nice quality 5 inch refractor for under £500. It's a brilliant scope to use for observing, and when you're backed up with so much aperture you can really pull out some great details on a whole range of objects. So that's my final review of this excellent AR127 from Bresser. I'm really glad I picked this scope up, and it's been a consistent performer for my solar imaging work, and also a fun scope to have for observation. I don't really run into any of the aberrations you can sometimes find in achromatic refractors, but that's mostly down to the fact that I'm imaging with a mono camera. When fringing does appear in my occasional visual sessions, it's not something that bothers me, and it's certainly less severe because of the scope's slower focal ratio. I've been really pleased with the optical quality of this scope, and it's a solid design with a nice chunky focuser. I have no complaints about the images I'm getting out of it, and it's been super easy to fit and replace all my upgraded accessories. Some important factors you need to consider are around mounting, and the additional cost of accessories needed to do the jobs that you want the scope to do. As you can see, this is a big scope, and its length really demands a beefier mount, whether you're planning imaging or observing sessions with it. You need to think about clearance off the ground too, especially for visual work, or you'll end up on the ground on your back if an object's too high in the sky. For tracking targets for imaging, the long focal length, especially when using something like a quark, means you'll need a solid and stable platform to keep your images on target. To make things easier for my intended purposes, I've had to add a good deal of gear and accessories to fit this scope to my requirements. All you seasoned astro folks out there know additional expenditure and rabbit hole excavations are pretty much par for the course in this hobby, but it's something you need to consider. I already had most of the gear I use with a scope, so for me it was just a case of buying the scope and adding what I needed to. If you do have some gear you can use though, or you're happy to start building out an imaging or observing rig, then the budget price of this scope on its own is hard to beat. You're getting a lot of aperture for your money, and a well built and nicely configured scope with some fine optics, so it's a great deal in my opinion. A refractor is such a versatile instrument, and I can see me using the scope for a long time to come, so I highly recommend it. I'm hoping to do some live streams before the sun gets too low for us here in Scotland, so you can see the Bresser in action, if conditions play ball. I'll share some images now that I've managed to get with the scope over the past couple of years, and I'd love for you to follow my social media channels to check out my new images as I upload them. Have you used some of the Bresser range, or do you have an alternative favourite scope? 
let us know in the comments below and share your experiences. If you have any questions, feel free to ask and I'll do my best to answer them.